Good evening. Everybody hear me okay? Should I tone it down a bit? Uh, no. Thank you for coming tonight. This is uh, one of my favorite talks to give. Uh, I fell in love with this talk even as a, a teenager uh, after reading the book, The Day Christ Died. Uh, but before I get started, let's see, you have an advertisement you'd like to make. Right? So here we are during Holy Week, and we're about to experience tonight, hopefully, a sense of what Jesus went through that night. We read the Gospels every year. We hear this story about how Jesus suffered and died for us, but I always feel like something is left out. And we as Americans love details, sometimes gory details, about what happened. Tonight, we're going to share some of those details. Those details come from historians like Tertullian, Pliny the Elder, Seneca, Josephus, historians that lived uh, during the time of Christ or, or shortly after, that documented his death. We also look at other historians and archaeologists who have collected information through the years. And some of that is, is rather recent. Uh, as, as late as 2007, they were unearthing skeletal remains in Gabello, Italy, of, of crucified men. We know that uh, also there's a great deal of information from physicians, men and women who have studied the death of Jesus and have come to realize exactly what he went through. Now, the Gospels clean it up. It's a clean version. And, and my, my fear is that we as Americans, certainly, we see Jesus almost as a mythological creature, as someone, a legendary creature. Let me put it bluntly, as a Marvel magazine character. You know, somebody who, yes, didn't really exist. You know, we've heard bits and pieces, and yes, the gospel, and and there are people even today that you'll come across that, that don't believe that he really lived or that he died. I'm here to tell you tonight that he did. And this is an examination of the last 30 hours of his life. Those 30 hours begin at 545 on the 13th day of Nisan, the Jewish month of Nisan. The 13th day was the day before the Passover, the 14th day. The Passover would begin in the evening when the sun went down. That was the official beginning of the next day where, you know, we, for us, it's midnight where we change dates. For the Jews, it was sundown. And so the position of the sun from morning to night was, was very important to them. It started about 5.45 in the morning because that's when, when it began to get light. On that day, 
I can tell you for a fact, the sun rose at 6.11 in the morning. We can trace it back to the very day and exactly when the sun rose. So it would have been light about 5.45. The Jews would have uh, risen from their sleep as soon as it got light out because their work day actually started about 6 o'clock. The Jews would work from 6 in the morning until about noon and then would take a three-hour break because at certain times of the year, it was just too hot. As a matter of fact, one of the historians had once wrote that between noon and 3 o'clock, only dogs, flies, and soldiers would would walk around and, and carry on. The rest of the people would relax, take a nap, go off, have a meal, and then come back at 3 o'clock and work again until 6 in the evening. So we know that for Jesus, he started his day probably about 545, somewhere around 6 o'clock. And being a human being, he did what human beings do when he first got up. What do you do first in the morning? Anybody? Use the restroom. That's right. Um, the Jews didn't have uh, restrooms, but they were very sanitary people and very hygienic. And uh, most likely Jesus went off into the bushes and did his thing. And, and maybe more than one thing, even. I tell you that not to, to degrade Jesus, but to help you realize he was a human being who peed and pooped. And we forget that. We, we somehow don't imagine our Savior doing those things, but he was a man. And then chances are he may have had a slight breakfast. And I say slight because... The Jews typically didn't spend a lot of time, uh, a lot of energy, fixing breakfast. What they would have had, uh, most likely, was an herbal tea or herbal water. They would have had possibly a piece of bread. And they would have had, in that time, at that time of year, maybe some fruit. But very light. They had two main meals of the day, at noon and in the evening. And so Jesus would have followed that same pattern. During the day, uh, Jesus uh, slept that night in Bethany, which was about three miles from Jerusalem by, by walking distance. Um, he would have carried on with those who were around him. He stayed in Bethany at the house of Lazarus. And so Martha and Mary were there, his mother Mary, and most likely all or most of the apostles. And he would have spent the day speaking to them, trying to share the last bits of knowledge that he had with them. Because remember, Jesus was with this group of 12 for about two and a half to three years. And he was like their teacher. And he would impart as much information down at their level as, as he could. And sometimes he would just talk way over their level, and they were just confused. These guys were a bunch of fishermen and, and ordinary people who 11 of them came from Galilee. There was only one who came from Judea. Galilee is about 40 or 50 miles north of Jerusalem, and Judea is to the south of Jerusalem. And that one apostle was Judas. Judas Iscariot. It's actually Judas Ish Kerioth. Kerioth was a city that was about 40 miles south of Jerusalem. And so Judas from Kerioth, Judas Iscariot. He didn't have many friends. Probably the only friend that he had out of, out of the 12, a close friend, would have been Jesus himself. He was sort of an outsider. 
Jesus was with his 12 apostles that day. We know that at some point, he sent two of them off to Jerusalem. Peter and John, they were his favorites. He sent them off to Jerusalem to get ready for the evening's meal. This was the Passover meal, a very important Jewish holiday, a holy day. And so he sent them off, and he said something like this. He says, listen, I want the two of you to go into Jerusalem, and I want you to find a man carrying a water jug and come up to the man and tell him that the master would like to have dinner at his house that evening. Not a difficult task, except if you know what's going on in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city, and you don't have to worry about the detail here, but it's a city, if you can imagine, almost the shape of this black outline. This map shows the details, but it was about a mile and a half long by about a mile to, I'm sorry, a half a mile to three quarters of a mile wide. And in that city lived about 100,000 people. That's what it is estimated at. Now, I've seen estimates by historians that go from 60,000 to 100,000. But in my mind, it really doesn't matter. Within the walls of Jerusalem, there were about 300 acres. So let's think about this for a minute. Let's take a mile and a half here in the White Lake area. Let's start, say, at Pitkins. Okay? You got that in your mind? And then let's go down Colby Street to Walmart. That's about a mile and a half. And then, if you can imagine going over about half a mile or three quarters of a mile, I'm not sure what that would be, if it'd be Warner Street or, or White Lake Drive, something like that, that in that area would be comparable to what Jerusalem was in terms of area. But now, take that area in Whitehall, and put 100,000 people in it. Yeah, can you imagine how, how tightly packed that area would have been? Now, here's the catch. On the high holy day of Passover, that number rose from 100,000 to 300,000 because all the men who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem were to come and celebrate at the temple and so you had a lot of people coming in from outside. But it wasn't just from 15 miles away. There would be people who would make pilgrimages from hundreds of miles away. And they came to the holy city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover meal. 300,000 people. Now let's go back to what Jesus said. Go and find a guy carrying a water jug. <laughs> that would be like... Me sending you to Grand Rapids and, and telling you to do the same thing. Go find a guy carrying a water jug. It seems impossible. Except if you know Jewish culture. And that is that men didn't carry water jugs. That was a woman's job. And so it would have been a little unusual to see a man carrying a water jug. The two apostles entered on the southwest corner of Jerusalem through the fountain gate, or it was also called the water gate. Um, I'm sure there must have been an apostle named Nixon somewhere in there. But, <laughs> um, but they entered through, through the, uh, the water gate, and they would have passed the, the pool of Siloam, and they would have come across this man. This man was the father of the disciple Mark, who was a young kid, probably about the age of the apostle John. John was a young kid. And there, he, these two apostles met with this man and said, the master would like to have the Passover meal at your house tonight. 
the father of Mark was a wealthy man. And he lived in the southwest part of the city where the rich lived. And so his house was a little bit bigger. It definitely had two floors to it. And that night, they were going to celebrate the Passover meal in the upper room. So, Sennacherib is a Latin word which simply means upper room. And hence, we get the word Senecal, the name of that upper room. It's now about uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, and Jesus begins to make his way to Jerusalem. I want you to think of who you would have been in the story. In this story of the Passover and the story of the passion and death of Christ, think about which of the, which of the characters you would have been. Or, or maybe you can place yourself in several characters' minds. I want you to think about the mindset of the apostles. As they walk from Bethany, the ten who are still with Jesus, they walk from Bethany to Jerusalem. They would have come through the east side, the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was about 80 feet higher than the walls of Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem were made of white limestone, and they were about 40 feet high, except on the parapets, different parapets or towers that would have been around the city. And there would have been lookouts on these parapets. Some were looking for things like the sunrise in the morning. And there was one that was assigned, a priest that was assigned to look out and see the sunrise come over the mountaintops of Moab. And he would yell, the sun is shining over Moab. And everyone would cheer because the workday really had started at that point. So you have these, these 40-foot walls and then these, these parapets or towers that were anywhere from 12 to 20 feet higher than that. And then there's the temple. The temple was 40 feet higher than the walls of Jerusalem. So imagine if you are a poor farmer or a fisherman or a, a woman who had come to Jerusalem for these holy days, and you saw this 40-foot wall, and then another 40 feet of building beyond that, and you were used to living in, in a, a hovel, a, a one- or two-room home that was very common, most common for the Jews at that time, something very small, something with not a very high ceiling. The average height of a man at that time was five foot five. We think Jesus might have been a couple inches taller. But five foot five, the average height of a man. And so the, the ceilings were not that high. But here you are, you're coming to Jerusalem, and you see this magnificent structure in front of you. And, and imagine Jesus walking over the Mount of Olives and then looking down on this city and seeing the sun, much like we're seeing now, sort of that yellow sun that comes in late afternoon, shining on the white walls of the city of Jerusalem. And they truly were white walls. They were, the walls were made of limestone. And they were, they were chunks of rock that were 20 feet long by about three and a half feet wide. And they were moved into place over hundreds of years to build this city. During the high holy days, the priests, and there were about a thousand priests, um, that would come and they would wash the walls so that any visitors coming would truly be amazed at the splendor of Jerusalem. So here it is. Jesus comes with his apostles. Think of how the apostles felt. They had been with Jesus now for two and a half years, but lately things were getting a little squeamish. 
because Jesus had entered the holy city on Palm Sunday amidst celebration. But they also knew that there were a lot of eyes on Jesus who didn't particularly like what was happening. You will find out that the death of Jesus had a lot to do with money. Not just the 30 pieces of silver that Judas collected, but it was the temple treasury. Because when Jesus came into Jerusalem, one of the things that he did in that week was he kicked over the money tables in the temple area. The temple area was filled with money changers, with salesmen, and they were selling all kinds of things, doves and, and cloaks and the prayer shawls. And there was a lot of money that flowed through the temple. As a matter of fact, there was a temple tax that everyone had to pay, and then uh, there was a profit from everything that was sold. The chief priests would oversee the amount of money coming in. To put it in today's terms, it would have been, in a year, about $125 million. At the time, it was about $1.25 million. But when you do the math and you, you come ahead, it, it was an incredible amount of money. Now, Caiaphas, the high priest, knew that Jesus was kicking over tables, scaring people away from the temple. And there goes his money. So that's why Caiaphas was after Jesus. Besides the fact that Jesus said that he was the Son of God, that was blasphemy. That was a capital crime. But they had to catch him saying that as well. So going back to this little trip to Jerusalem, the apostles are now coming over this, this hilltop, the Mount of Olives, and they look down on the city, and what do you think they're feeling? They're with a criminal, and they could be caught with him. And they begin processing what could happen, not only to Jesus, but to them. And that scared the bejeebers out of them. But nonetheless, they made their way. Now think about it. If there were 300,000 people, it would have been difficult for the temple guards, for Caiaphas and his his father-in-law, Annas, to, um, to actually capture Jesus and the apostles. There were a lot of people there. He would have had to have guards at every door. The apostles and Jesus make their way also through the fountain gate, across the city to the upper room. Amazingly, the upper room is about 300 feet from Caiaphas's house. So that led to the anxiety as well. Things were packed in very tightly in the city of Jerusalem. Mark's father, being a rich man, had the pleasure of living near rich people, one of those being Caiaphas, the chief priests. Here they are, they get to the upper room. I can tell you how Jesus got upstairs that night. It was through limestone steps on the outside of the building because most of the buildings did not have any kind of interior stairwells. They would go up to the outside. This city uh, is on the longitude about equal to Macon, Georgia. So a little bit south of where we live, certainly. A little bit hotter, a little bit warmer. This was the end of the rainy season. The rainy season began in October and continued until about the 1st of April. And during that time, everything grew. So April 1st, right about this time, we think that Jesus probably died on April the 6th. When he died, 
and certainly the evening that they walked to Jerusalem, the area would have been green. The, the pricks, the little streams would have been filled with water uh, because it, it would rain up until literally a certain day and then it would stop and it would turn arid for several months and very hot. So here Jesus is, the apostles, they see this splendor. There would have been fruit popping all over the place. Olives and grapes, figs and dates. There would have been grains that would have been growing. And, and as they were picked, the farmers would have left some of the, uh, the fruit on the ground for the, the poor that could not afford to eat. And so the, the smell that night must have been incredible. This, this sweet smell of fruit. Jesus gets to the cenacle. He climbs the stairs. And then he does exactly what Scripture says. He reclined at table. Because at that time, the Jews did not sit in a chair. They reclined at table. They reclined because it was only slaves who would stand to eat. And so free men would recline at table. And I can even tell you what elbow he reclined on. It was his left elbow. You're going like, Dave, come on. Be realistic. How can you be sure? Well, because Jews at that time, uh, I said, are very cleanly people, but uh, the left hand was used to clean themselves. And so it was considered the, the dirty hand, and they would eat with their right. So they literally reclined at table on the left elbow. The tables were only about a foot off the ground, and chances are they would not have been made of wood, but of stone. The table would have been in the shape of a U, and at the closed end of the U would have been the guest of honor, and that would have been Jesus. It was in a U so that the servants could have come up and down and poured cups of wine and served food, and they wouldn't have gone on the outside and tried to climb over those who were laying down, they would have come in the middle. So it served a purpose. <clears throat> they, they would lie on these long uh, cushions called triclinia. They were 7 to 12 feet long. They were sewed around the edges, and on the inside would have been straw, and leaves, and sometimes cloth, but not very often because cloth was expensive and very valuable. So they wouldn't have wasted it putting it on the inside. And they were somewhat comfortable. They would be along the edges of this U-shaped table. Jesus sat in the middle. Who do you think was on one side of him? Peter would have been on one side. On the other side, not usually John. It would have been Judas. Now, for one reason, Jesus was probably Judas's only friend among the crowd. But secondly, Judas was the money keeper. So he had an important position. Judas would typically have sat next to Jesus on his right side. That night, because it was the feast of the Passover, John slipped in. Why? Because he was the youngest. He was probably somewhere 17, 18, 19 years old, somewhere in there, as was the disciple Mark. John slipped in and sat next to Jesus because of the ritual of the evening meal. The youngest 
had to ask the ritualistic questions. Father, why is this night different from all other nights? And the father would respond, this is the night we celebrate the Passover of the Lord. Father, why do we eat unleavened bread? Unleavened bread is the bread of affliction. It is the bread of haste. What happened is, you remember the story of Moses. How many of you saw the Ten Commandments Saturday night on TV? Yeah, a few of us. Well, it's a pretty good rendition, really. Uh, uh, so the story, just to refresh our memory, the story is that uh, taken from Exodus, that Moses was chosen by God uh, after speaking to him in the burning bush. Uh, you, you remember, if you watched the movie, it sounded something like this. Moses. Moses. Take off thy sandals, for thou art standing on holy ground. Moses had this conversation with God in the burning bush. And God listened to what Moses said. Moses said, haven't you heard the cry of your people who are slaves in Egypt? And God said, I have heard their cry. And I'm sending you to go and free them. Moses said, who am I, Lord, that I should go back to Egypt? He was kicked out of Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh had kicked him out because they found out uh, Moses was a high-ranking official in Egypt for a long time. And the favorite son of the Pharaoh, the favorite chosen one of the Pharaoh. And yet, once they found out that he was Hebrew and not Egyptian, uh, they realized that he could very well be the deliverer. And so the Pharaoh exiled him, sent him off into the desert. Eventually, Moses found his way to a family who took care, care of him, took him in. Moses does what the, the Lord commands. He goes back to Egypt, and then he goes up to Pharaoh, who really hated him, because Pharaoh was the son of the previous Pharaoh, who has now died. And so this guy was really jealous of Moses. Moses go, goes and says, Pharaoh, you got to let my people go. And Pharaoh says, yeah, right. You know, he says, no. And so you know what happened next. The, the ten plagues. What were some of those plagues? Frogs? Boils? The, 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 the water of the Nile turned blood red. Um, there, there were insects, locusts, there, it, it hailed, it was, you know, one thing after another. And every time Moses would, would go back, the, the sun didn't shine for three days. And the people were scared. And they came to Pharaoh and said, this God is powerful, you know. you, you got to let the people go. And he was like, no, not doing that. Not giving in to Moses. Until finally, Moses came to Pharaoh and said, here, here is it. By your own voice, you will choose the next plague. And Pharaoh had said, I'll show you. I'm going to have the firstborn of every Hebrew child killed. Moses goes, it's by your voice. You did it. So if you watch the movie, <laughs> you saw the cloud coming, crossing the full moon, coming down. It was the angel of death. And whatever it was, it killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, not the Hebrews, because Moses said to the Hebrews, kill a, a year-old lamb and take the blood 
and put it on the lintel, on the doorpost, so that when the angel of death comes, he will see that, know that you are Israelite, and he will pass over your house. So go ahead, 1,500 years, and Jesus is celebrating this meal with the apostles. Moses had eaten a meal in haste that night. John, the youngest, would be asking those questions. Why is this night different than all other nights? Why is this bread unleavened? It, they, unleavened simply means they, they didn't put yeast in it. They didn't let it rise. They ate it so it, it sort of looked like pita bread. Another question, why do we eat bitter herbs? In Hebrew, it's moror. We eat bitter herbs, the father would say, to remind us of the bitterness of slavery. Why do we dip the bitter herbs in salt water? It's to remind us of the tears of our ancestors who suffered for 400 years in slavery, generation after generation. They also ate something called charoseth. Charoseth was a mixture of cinnamon and wine and dates and figs and nuts. And it was all smashed together. And so it, it was somewhat sweet. And um, it looked, if you can imagine, lumpy applesauce. It was brown in color. It was the color of the mud that the slaves of the Israelites used to make bricks for all the buildings for Pharaoh. And they would eat it with a piece of bread, actually dip it in, like, like we eat, you know, chips and cheese, sort of, um, or salsa. They also had lamb. That, that year old lamb, unblemished. They would check it over at the temple, make sure it didn't have any blemishes. The day of Passover, or the day before Passover, there were something like 70,000 lambs that were slain. And the people would take it home, and they would eat all of it, except the entrails. The people weren't used to eating a lot of meat. So this was a major celebration. This is what the apostles were celebrating with Jesus. The meal would have started like this. Jesus would have stood uh, and said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Alehim, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God. The Lord is one. And thus began the Passover meal. Shortly after the meal began, the servants would come and take a towel and wrap it around their waist and would wash the hands of all those at the meal. It was a ritualistic cleansing. Here you go, Mike. Let me wash your hands. Yeah, there. Perfect. And then I'm going to give you the towel and I'm going to wipe your hands off. Only this night, he didn't let, Jesus did not let the servants do the ritualistic cleansing. Instead, he did something like this. He took the towel wrapped it around his waist, in this case, shoulders, and he came up and down around the outside of the U-shape, and he washed the feet of those who were there. The guest of honor would never do this. It was a humbling experience. And so, here Jesus would be washing the feet. We celebrate this on 
Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday evening as a reminder that Jesus showed us that we should be servants to other people. When Jesus got to Peter, Peter said, listen, I'm sorry, Jesus. You're not going to wash my feet, okay? Let's, let's get that clear. And we know that Jesus said, hey, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you can't come with me into the kingdom. And Peter was like, oh, wow. Wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my face. And Jesus said, no, this is enough. You're clean enough. And then Jesus proceeded with the meal. He would talk through the meal, and, and this meal lasted a long time. The apostles would get up and walk around and, and talk to each other. Jesus would have told them different things like, you know, I've longed to eat this meal with you, but this is the last time I'm going to do this until I enter the kingdom. And so the apostles were like, they were trying to figure out what he meant, what he would say. And so they, they'd go, what does he mean? Does he mean that he's not going to eat the Passover meal again until next year? And then maybe by then he'll be gone? You know, they had to be asking each other questions, confused. Because when Jesus spoke to them, they didn't always get it. As I said, these guys were fishermen. They were people of the earth. They were simple people. They were not well educated, except for maybe Matthew, who was a tax collector, and maybe Judas. They were simple people. Jesus goes on, and he said, I've longed to eat this meal with you, but one that I share this meal with is about to betray me. <laughs> then that really threw them. Jesus said, Scripture tells us that he, he probably used the words, he's about to raise his heel against me. And they were like, what? Because they knew each other. They had been together for two and a half years. And they knew each other. So who, who could possibly betray Jesus? And so here they are, seated around the table, and they're talking to each other, trying to guess who it is. And they're saying to each other, do you think it's me? I mean, geez, he knows better than anybody else, but it, it couldn't be me. Is it you? Peter looks at John and motions to ask the question of Jesus. So John leans in to Jesus' shoulder because he's seated right next to him. Most likely Judas would have been seated next to John. Peter would have been over on the left side. The left side is actually the place of honor, not the right side, because the left side is considered after the guest of honor. The right side is considered before the guest of honor. Not the way we think of things, but it was the way they looked at it. So John leans in and says, who is it? And Jesus says, it's the one that I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. And most likely, he dipped it in the chato set, that, that mud-looking substance. And he would have handed it to Judas. And Judas would have smiled, thinking, okay, that was an honor. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't know it's me. And then the apostles would have been up walking around at that time. Jesus would have looked at Judas and said, go do what you must do and do it quickly. And Judas would have gotten up and began walking out of the room. Now think, if you were there that night, what would you have done? jumped up and beat the bejeebers out of Judas. Because if he was being sent out of the room, obviously he was the troublemaker. Except what was the job of Judas? 
He was the money keeper. And it would have been natural for Jesus to send Judas out of the room time after time again at meals like this to go and to pay Mark's father for the food or to go and to give alms or to go and, and buy more food or, or to go and, and see if he can get a donation from Mark's father. You know, Judas was good at what he did. Think about it, two and a half years, Judas had to be a salesman. He had to sell Jesus to everyone that he met who he wanted to collect money from to support the little band of 12 or 13. Except Judas had a crisis of faith. Because of the money, what happened was Judas saw what was happening in the days prior. He knew that Caiaphas was upset. He knew maybe even the Romans were upset, although they're still sort of out of the picture at this point. But he certainly knew that the temple guards, the, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, uh, the ancients, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees did not want Jesus around. And so he got the idea that maybe I better get out of this somehow. And he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Judas would have went. And I said, why wouldn't they have jumped up and, and beat him up? Except that they knew that Judas would do this and would walk off from time to time. What about John and Peter? They knew. I can imagine Jesus putting a hand on each of them saying, don't do anything. Just sit there. This is what has to happen. The meal continues. At one point, Jesus takes bread, blesses it as his ritual, and then gives it out and says, this is my body. Later on in the meal, there were four cups of wine, four ritual cups of wine. There was even more wine that was consumed that night, but four ritual cups to mark the four sayings of God. The first cup, I will take you out of the land of captivity. The second cup, I will save you. The third cup, I will redeem you. And the fourth cup, I will make of you a nation. We think it was the third cup that as the supper ended, Jesus took the cup that would have looked much like this. Nothing very fancy. Would have been made most likely of clay. Not like the chalices that we see at the altar. It would have been something simple that a carpenter would have used. Something that looked like this, but he would have taken it and said, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. And he said, do this in memory of me. And he passed it around, and they drank out of the same cup. Typically, they each would have had a cup of wine, and they did. They still had a cup of wine beyond that. It was the words, do this in memory of me, that must have given the apostles goosebumps because this ritualistic celebration, Jesus was blowing it. He was doing things that were not common. And they must have said, okay, the old covenant that was established by Moses has been changed. Jesus is changing it. And this will be the new covenant. Something is different. And every time we do this, we're celebrating the body and blood of Christ. He will be with us. We as Catholics believe that. 
It is the body and the blood of Christ because Christ told us so. Jesus is still talking to them, teaching them. And now the time comes for the end of the meal. They dance. Would you dance with me? Absolutely. Come on. <laughs> Little did you know. All right. Raise your hands up like this. So they danced. They celebrated. They sang the Hallel, which is praise ye. And they would clap. And they would sing the song. And they would dance. Sort of almost like the hokey pokey, you know? <laughs> but but they, they'd be dancing around the table. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> This was a joyous moment. It was the end of this meal. They had made it through the meal without getting captured or, or arrested, and now it was time to end the meal. It was probably about 11 o'clock at night. You know, and during the meal, they would have been talking, moving around. There was a lot going on, but their stomachs were full. These guys were tired. They were pooped. What time did they get up? Yeah, about 6 in the morning, maybe even a little more than that. They may have taken a nap in the afternoon, but still, 11 o'clock at night, they're tired. They, their bellies were full. They weren't used to eating meat. And here they, they ate the whole lamb and bread and chadoseth and bitter herbs. And, and now they had also drank a lot of wine. And so they could have stayed right there at the cenacle. Think about it. It would have been a great place to hang out all night. You've just eaten, just go over into the corner and fall asleep. But Jesus wanted to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. It was the place where he enjoyed going when he came to Jerusalem. They would stay there. And what I'd like you to do is to stand for about 30 seconds and move around and get the blood flowing in your seat because we're about to get serious. Do the hokey pokey, that's all right. <laughs> Simon says yes. You okay? All right. They begin making their way through the city again. They're, they're going out the water gate as they did when they went in. It was moving away from the house of Caiaphas, which is good. Now they're going to walk along the wall, along the Kidron Valley, along um, the, the Cedron Brook that flowed on the east side of Jerusalem. Remember at that time of year, this, this little brook, it would have been similar to Buttermilk Creek. Can you picture that in your mind? Think of behind... Um, the post office, you know, where it comes down the hill. They're working on it now, I think, where it comes down the hill. And uh, there's a little waterfall there now. And, and, and you watch as the water churns over that. That's what they would have heard that night. They're walking along the wall uh, on, a, on a pathway that would not have been much wider than this. And all along the wall that night, remember... This was the night of a full moon because Passover was celebrated on the 14th day of Nisan, the first night of a full moon. That's why we celebrate our Easter when we do. It is the Sunday after the, the full moon in the springtime. So here along these white walls, 40 feet high, would have been braziers. So I'm going to go back and say, do you remember Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom or something? <laughs> you know, uh, he had braziers like this. They would have been soaked in, in oil, and they would have been set ablaze, and they would have burned through much of the night. And these would have been placed along the wall from 
you know, maybe every hundred feet or so. The, the city was, you remember how long? About a mile and a half long. Um, so there were a lot of braziers that night. The, the temple, as they were approaching the temple, would have been very majestic that night. The temple was 1,600 feet long and 970 feet wide. So that's a chunk of the city of Jerusalem. And here they are walking down this path with Jesus. How many people were in the area that night, do you think? About 300,000 people. And they were camped all over the hills, all around the outskirts of Jerusalem, because there were no holiday inns. There, there may have been some inns, but they would have been packed, uh, but, but very few in the city of Jerusalem. There just wasn't a lot of space for an inn. So these people would have been camped on the hillsides. And as they walked along, they would have seen the fires of the camps all along. And here, these white walls glimmering in the blue light of the moon and the yellow light of these braziers. And as they walked along, they would have seen people coming and going from the temple. You know, I always had the, the vision that Jesus, when he was walking with his apostles, were sort of alone. Not at all. There were people all over the place. And as they walked along, they probably had to avoid people on the same path, going different ways. But when they came to a quiet time, Jesus would have turned to them and said, listen, I, I, I got to tell you this. Y you know, you remember what I said? Um, don't carry a, a walking stick or a sword or sandals on your feet. Now I'm saying do that because you're going off. You're, you're going on a mission. So go ahead, take a sword with you. Take a carrying stick with you. Take a bag with you. Wear sandals on your feet. Then he'd walk along and he'd say, you know, if people hate you, don't worry because they hated me first. Just remember that. And then he'd walk along and he'd stop again and he'd say, you know, I'm not going to be with you much longer, but, but don't worry because I'm going to send a helper, a paraclete. Paraclete is a Greek word, which means counselor. The Holy Spirit. Another sign from God. And he was cramming just like you're cramming for a test. He was running out of time, and he began to worry. Is this enough? The man part of him began to worry. Is this enough? Have I done enough? Have I got the message across? How, how do I continue to, to send them this message that, you know, you saw what I did when I washed your feet? Now you've got to do that. This is my commandment to you. Love one another as I have loved you. Holy Thursday, uh, in the Catholic Church, we call it Holy Thursday. In the, in the Protestant tradition, they call it Monday Thursday. It comes from the Latin word mandatum, a commandment, I command you. And that was Jesus' command that night. Love one another as I have loved you. And they make their way along. And, and if you can imagine this, when Jesus would stop, the apostles would gather around him, much like you saw the NCAA basketball tournament. Time out, the coach would come, and the players would huddle around him. And, and together they would, they would be really quiet and listen to what the coach was saying. They finally made their way to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, to, to try and help give you a visual, was about 13,000 square feet. Not large. So what is 13,000 square feet? Well, Van Andel Arena in Grand Rapids is 162,000 square feet. 13,000 square feet. The VAC, the Viking Athletic Center, <laughs> 
is 40,000 square feet. So it, it's about a third. The Garden of Gethsemane was about a third of what the athletic center was. The Garden of Gethsemane might have been equal to church and the hall together. So not a, a, a large area, uh, but large enough. And what was in the Garden of Gethsemane? They were olive presses. There were several different kinds of olive presses. Some were in caves. Those that were in caves, um, they were cut into the limestone in the side of the hill, and they had a turntable in them, and, and the turntable would crush the olives, and uh, the olive oil would be collected. And, and the turntable was, um, was turned by donkeys, occasionally by men, but most of the time by donkeys. And they would press the olives, and, and the olive oil would drip into cisterns. They would set the cisterns aside and let the sediment settle for days. And then they would come back, and they would fill their jars with olive oil because they used olive oil uh, for healing, for, for cooking, uh, to use as fuel for their tapers and, and their braziers in their own homes. The other kind of press would look something like this. It would be sort of looking like a chair. The bags of olives would be placed on this part and then huge round stones would be set on top. And each stone that was placed on it would squeeze the olives more and more and the juice would be caught into a bowl or a cistern at the bottom. And the analogy is that that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was pressed like a bag of olives. He felt such pressure. He came with the apostles. The apostles all went off and laid down. They were tired. Peter, James, and John, and said, come with me to pray. And they would have walked a short distance, maybe from, from here to the baptismal font away. And the three of the apostles would have gotten up close to a, a tree and begun to doze off. Jesus went and prayed on a rock, alongside a rock. Scripture tells us that in, in the Gospel of Luke, that he began to sweat and that his drops fell like drops of blood. There is a medical term called hematidrosis in which a person has such pressure, um, they're, they're under such intense scrutiny that the muscles tighten and the little capillaries near the surface of the skin actually burst. Uh, an example of this might be a, a, a mother who is delivering a baby. Push! And what happens oftentimes in the cheeks? The capillaries burst. And, and mom will have this little redness. In this case, we believe that Jesus was so pressured that his capillaries burst. In hematidrosis, the capillaries burst and escape the only avenue that it has, and that's through the sweat glands. This wasn't just Jesus that this happened to, but throughout history, we see in World War I, World War II, and unfortunately, probably in Ukraine right now, as the bombs are falling, as people are waiting for the bombs to reach them, they are under such incredible pressure, such anxiety, that potentially their capillaries burst as well. Jesus prays, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He began to sweat. You can imagine he had long hair. The hair would have covered his face, matted to his face. 
he would have been looking up into the moonlight, praying to his father, knowing as a man what he was about to endure. I can't even imagine what that would have been like. I can imagine, though, the shadows of the olive trees around him falling on his face in the moonlight. And here we go. Soon he knows that the soldiers are coming. He can see them. Remember that this uh, Mount of Olives, this Garden of Gethsemane, is above um, the walls of Jerusalem. So he sees these soldiers coming. So here's what happens. Caiaphas, once Pilate, I'm sorry, Caiaphas, once Judas came to him, um, ordered temple guards to form, and then they were going off to get Jesus. But but, uh, Caiaphas had an idea. If I can get Pilate involved in this, it will be a show of force. So Caiaphas goes to Pilate's house, most likely as Jesus and the apostles are walking up to the Garden of Gethsemane, and says, listen, Pilate, they, they, they stayed outside of the Fortress Antonia. The Fortress Antonia was part of the temple area. It was on the, the northern edge um, of the, the temple, and it's where Pilate stayed. Caiaphas wanted to get Pilate involved because if there was trouble, the Roman soldiers were much more formidable than the temple guards. And if he could get Pilate involved, then it was a real show of force. Pilate listened to Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says, listen, this guy has been a troublemaker. He has been saying things like he is the deliverer, he is the Messiah, you know, and Pilate was like, you know, I could care less, Caiaphas. But Pilate thought about money. He thought about trouble. He thought about this is the high holy days. Remember, the Passover is seven days long. The Passover meal was celebrated on the first night, but it was seven days of celebration. These people were going to be around for a long time. He didn't want any trouble. So he probably looked at Caiaphas and said, okay, listen, I don't want any trouble either. I'm going to send out a tribune with you and a bunch of soldiers. We think it may have been anywhere 12 to 24 soldiers on top of the temple guards. Jesus would have seen them coming because they would have been carrying braziers to light the way. And they would have been walking through hundreds if not thousands of people who were camped along the hillside. Pilate understood that if if enough people liked Jesus, they could cause trouble. But the show of force would stop that immediately. They make their way up the hill. Jesus comes to his apostles that were sleeping and says, get up, the hour has come for man to be glorified. I'm being delivered into the hands of a traitor. They jump up, and they're like, oh, crap. I can just imagine how scared they were because they saw their lives flash before their eyes. Now, here comes the soldiers, and they... Scripture tells us the tribune would have said, uh, done the speaking that night. Jesus said, who are you looking for? The tribune said, Jesus of Nazareth. That's me. And they were, would have sort of been shocked and also a little afraid because they heard about this guy, Jesus, who had performed miracles, who had done wondrous kinds of things. They even asked again, Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And then Judas comes up and kisses Jesus. 
Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should have sat in the back, yes. How about a kiss? <laughs> the kiss would have been on the cheek. It was not unusual for men to kiss other men. Uh, it's, it's, today, is even it's a, a European nicety. You, you may see uh, from time to time uh, two premieres. Yes, yeah, give them a little peck on the cheek. That would have been quite normal in those days, too. There, there were other oddities. Uh, remember I said that the left hand was the unclean hand? Men would walk together, uh, friends, they would take their right hands. Is this your right hand? Yeah, this is okay. And they would walk along. You know, I'm going to turn around so they can see us. <laughs> so, so friends would walk with their right hands joined together, and they'd be talking, and, and this was a sign of friendship. Um, if we saw two guys you know, walking downtown Montague, holding hands, it would throw us a little bit in today's society, but uh, not unusual back then. The right hand was still the clean hand. So here is Jesus. He, uh, he's been identified. Now things happen quickly. The Roman soldiers were trained very well. They would have formed a box around the prisoner. The tribune would have come up and uh, placed a loose noose around the prisoner. Would have looked something like this, not real thick rope. And then they would have pushed his hand up into the middle of his back. You may not be able to clean tomorrow with this. <laughs> and they would have tied one hand, and then pushed the other hand. You need to take yoga, Tom. <laughs> you need to get these hands right between the shoulder blades. They would have bent him over and really, I, I won't do that to you, <laughs> but they would have tied his hands. Now, this had a specific purpose because now if he tried to get away and use his hands, what would happen? Yeah. He, he pulls the rope on his neck. The tribune then would have done one other thing. With his elbow, he would have come up into the nose of the prisoner. And that was an attempt to actually break the cartilage in the nose and cause the nose to swell. What happens when your nose swells? You're breathing through your mouth. And I just had a sinus infection. And it was, it was miserable. I was miserable. And that's the way Jesus would have been. Then the tribune would have done this. With his heel, he would have come down on the instep of the prisoner, jammed it down to try and break a bone. And if not to break a bone, then to leave a really deep bruise? Why? because now it's going to be more difficult. If this prisoner did escape, let's say the apostles attacked and Jesus ran off, now he's trying to run off on a bruised foot or a broken bone and trying to breathe through his nose and, and trying to use his hands. Have you ever tried to run like this? Um, really difficult. There would have been a box of soldiers around him. So let me use the Knights of Columbus. This is a Knights thing. Jerry, you want to come? Uh, John, there. Dave, yeah. Be my soldiers. If you would, form a box around him. Yeah, there you go. And, and that was to protect anyone that they could see from coming and trying to free him. They would then move down. But these soldiers would have their way with the prisoner. 
So you would need to, with your elbows, uh, hit Tom as many times as you can. <laughs> That's what happened to Jesus that night. He was hit repeatedly. The, the, the Roman soldiers would try to inflict as much pain as possible. The entire crucifixion was an incredible painful event. As a matter of fact, uh, something I recently read, Seneca, uh, the, the Roman historian, actually wrote about some of the uh, crucifixions that he saw. Just to show you how bad it was, um, he said, I saw men that, that were crucified upside down, head first, and then uh, I saw men that were impaled to the genitals. And then I saw a man who was crucified, and around his neck was a rope from which hung his strangled child. That was the Romans of that time incredibly cruel, and now they're going to walk along, and they're going to go to Caiaphas's house. Where is Caiaphas's house? About 300 feet, feet from the Senecal. So now they're going to walk along the outside of the city, along the wall. Chances are they didn't want to go through the city because there were a lot of people who were still going to the temple, even at that time of night. Some were actually people who had already been asleep and were the early risers at 2 in the morning. And now they were going to the temple before the rest of the people would go later in the day. So they began making their way along the wall. Come over here, guys, if you would. Yeah. Tom, you have to suffer through this the most. So think about how far they walked um, from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now they're walking along the outside of the wall. The Roman soldiers may have actually stopped and, and once they got to the fortress Antonia, but the temple guards would have walked Jesus to the house of Caiaphas. It was about a mile walk. And all the time, boom, 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 kicking him spitting on him. <laughs> Their idea was to inflict as much pain as possible before the prisoner arrived to where they were going. They would have taken him to Caiaphas's house. In Hebrew, uh, Caiaphas is a, is a Latin term. In Hebrew, it is Caiapha. It was the house of Caiapha. And he was the high priest he lived in a rather luxurious house, and right across the courtyard lived his father-in-law, Annas, who had been the former high priest, still had a lot of control over the temple treasury. They brought him to Caiaphas's house. Caiaphas examined him, looked at him, and said, you know what? Take him to Pilate. So here in the early morning, they walked back to the Fortress Antonia. How far was it? About three quarters of a mile. All the while, being kicked, pushed, tripped. They would raise him up, spit on him, elbow him, kick him from behind. They would pull his hair. It's even thought that some historians believe that uh, there's a part of scripture that says, they plucked my beard. They actually would have pulled his hair out. They made their way back to, uh, to Fortress Antonia and to Pilate. Pilate doesn't want any of this. This early morning now, the sun is, is maybe starting to come up. It may be around 5.30. Jesus comes to Pilate. Pilate looks at him and says, so what's this about? 
It's like, well, Caiaphas sent him over to you. Um, Pilate doesn't want anything to do with him. And they, they hear the cries of the men that the high priest has gathered in the courtyard. And they said, they want this man put to death. Before he went to Pilate's, Caiaphas called the Sanhedrin together. The Sanhedrin came in the middle of the night. The Sanhedrin was a chief, uh, was ancient scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. So that we understand, the, the Pharisees were people who believed in oral tradition. The Sadducees were people who believed in the letter of the law. The Sadducees did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in angels. The Pharisees, though, believed in sort of everything. And they believed in oral law. So they could make laws, they could interpret laws, they could change laws. And they were the ones who were pretty much in charge. The Sanhedrin consisted, they, they were the ruling body, the judges, consisted of 71 men. Scribes, Pharisees, ancients. Um, and these 71 men would meet every day, except on the Sabbath, from 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, and they would hear cases, a lot of civil cases. Occasionally they would hear a capital case, like Jesus was going to be. But one of the rules was they could not meet at night, except Caiaphas got them together at night. They could not pass judgment on a man in the same day that they heard testimony, except they did. Caiaphas asked in front of those who had gathered, to hear a capital case, they had to have at least 23 members of the Sanhedrin present. There were probably even more that came. There were 71 that eventually showed up including a couple of men that, that Jesus uh, was friends with. But they asked Jesus repeatedly the questions about, you know, who, who are you? Who do you say that you are? They had witnesses come before uh, the Sanhedrin, and the, the witness counter, contradicted each other. And then finally, Caiaphas said, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Yeah, and at first Jesus didn't respond much, but then he said, yeah, it's as you say. And Caiaphas at that point ripped his clothes and said, Gadufa, Hebrew for blasphemy. He said, we have no further need of witnesses. This case is over. He has committed blasphemy. That is a crime punishable by death. Now take him to Pilate because we can't put anybody to death. They could, but they had to have Pilate's permission. So they wanted to take Jesus to Pilate. Again, it is now about six in the morning. They go to Pilate. Pilate says, okay, so this is Jesus, the guy that got me out of bed. You know, I, I look at him. He doesn't look like much. You know, are you the Messiah? Are you a king? And he wouldn't say anything. And those who had gathered out in the courtyard, uh, the, the friends of Caiaphas and Annas, the members of the Sanhedrin said, wait a minute. Uh, listen to this guy. Look at him. He's causing problems. He says he's, he's the Messiah. His, he says he's the son of God. That's blasphemy. He's got to be put to death. And Pilate's like, I don't want to put this guy to death. I heard that he preaches peace. And then he says, the, he hears from the crowd saying, this guy's been a troublemaker ever since he came from Galilee. And Pilate goes, Galilee? Ah. I'll send him to Herod. Herod was the tetrarch of, of Galilee, the governor of 
Galilee. Galilee was about 50 miles to the north. And so Herod was in town for the, uh, the holy days. And so they walked him to Herod's palace. How far was that? Herod's palace was about 400 feet from Caiaphas' house. So now they're walking about three quarters of a mile back to get to Herod's palace. And what happens? Herod looks at him and says, you are the Christ, you know, the great Jesus Christ. Why don't you perform some miracles for me? Change these stones into bread. Change this water into wine. And Jesus did this. So he says, <laughs> he's a king. Let's make him look like a king. And they got a, a red co cloak. They threw it around his shoulders. Yeah. There. Doesn't he look like a king? Send him back to Pilate. So he goes back to Pilate. Pilate now says, Herod found that he was innocent. Pilate found, finds that he's innocent. He's going to be released. Pilate had already sat on the curial chair. It was the chair from which decisions were made. He had made, before he sent Jesus to Herod, he had made the decision that Jesus was innocent and he was going to let him go. But then he heard about Herod. He said, I'll send him to Herod. Herod and Pilate hated each other. And they hated each other for a particular reason. Um, Pilate had the great idea that he was going to build an aqueduct from Bethlehem, which was six miles south of Jerusalem. He was going to build the aqueduct that would go into Jerusalem and bring fresh water. And guess what? He was going to use the temple treasury to do this. And he was going to use the Galileans to do this. And those Judeans as well. He was going to use the Jews to build this. There were protests that happened. And on a given day, Pilate saw people coming into the courtyard, into his courtyard. He thought that they were protesting. So he had many of them killed. It turns out that the people were from Galilee simply on a pilgrimage to visit Jerusalem. Pilate had mistakenly killed the Galileans. Herod was ticked, and they were enemies until this night, and they renewed their friendship. So here he is. Pilate gets a lot of static from the crowd. He's already said, I declared him innocent. Herod's found him innocent. I'm going to let him go. And the people are yelling, no, crucify him. He needs to be put to death. So finally, Pilate gives in. He decides, I'm going to have him scourged. And now we've stripped the body. Uh, this guy, you have to take your clothes off now. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> okay. He was taken to a place called the Lithostrotos. The Lithostrotos is a, is a stone courtyard in the Fortress Antonia. And uh, it, it was surrounded by walls. Uh, and in this courtyard, there were three or four stone pillars. Archaeologists have actually uncovered those pillars. And the pillars would have been um, about three or four feet high. And they had iron rings on either side of them. So the prisoner would have been placed by the soldiers, and the soldiers would tie his hands down to these, these rings. Yes. And that's what he would have looked like, only he would have been naked. And then a lictor would have taken a flagellum. <laughs> 
you look like you might enjoy this. <laughs> the flagellum would have looked very much like this. So it, it would have had a handle uh, wrapped in leather, would have had leather tongs, and at the bottom of these leather tongs would have been bits of stone and glass, shards of pottery, and they would have been tied, and it would have been pretty heavy. So, John, let's imagine that those are there. And if you would, get way back and then give a, a running... Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, that's good. Oh, that's... Uh, now you're working. Work it, John, work it. <laughs> now, we laugh. But what was happening to Jesus was that uh, the stones and the chips would dig in and rip the flesh away. As you pull back on the whip, this is called the flagellum. As you pull back on the flagellum, it would have ripped the flesh, and there would have been a pool of blood that would have formed. Jews would use the same punishment, only they would not whip someone for more than 40 lashes. The Romans didn't have a particular amount. They would continue this repeatedly. John, go ahead. Um, and they would come around the genitals? Yes. <laughs> right. On all sides, so that at some point, no, okay, good enough. <laughs> at some point, the prisoner would collapse. Yeah, go down on your knees if you can. Or you, that's the hardest part, isn't it? And then they would have taken the prisoners, the, the centurion or the tribune would have come over, and if Jesus had hair, um, <laughs> they would have taken his hair, pulled his head back, and looked at the eyes. And if the eyes had rolled back into the head, they know that he would have been in shock. That's what they were looking for, was to get him to the point where he was in shock. At that point, he was bleeding profusely, and his, his flesh had huge wounds in it. And even though he was attacked from behind, the, the flagellum would have caught him everywhere, on the front of the legs, in the private parts, in his chest, on his head. And now they would have looked, and sure enough, he is in shock. So they would have stopped. It could have lasted three minutes. It could have lasted 13 minutes. We're not really sure. But with the kind of force and the, the kind of pain that this man would have been in, it probably didn't last all that long. And now we're going to let his hands be freed. So soldiers, make believe that you are removing these chains, and the guy would have fallen to the floor. Can you do that for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Tom, can you go down on the floor? You, you may need some help out. Yeah. Little did you know. All right. He would have been lying in his own pool of blood. The Romans, as I said, tried to be as cruel as possible. Around the courtyard would have been bowls around the lithostrotos. And these bowls would have been used to wash their feet before they entered a building. And so bowls of water would have been at strategic places around the lithostrotos. And now uh, they would have taken this water and they would have poured it on the man. And they would have taken something else. Also in the lithostrotos were other buckets for urine, where the soldiers would come up and urinate into a bucket. And there would have been a lid on this to keep the flies away. They would have taken this off. Dave, you get to pour the urine on. Um, they, they would have thrown both on the man who was collapsed. Now, imagine the way that felt on the open wounds. 
And why did they do this? Because they wanted him awake so that he could feel the pain. That's, what, that's how bad the Romans were. Now they would lift the soldier up. Or I'm sorry, the prisoner up. Soldiers, yeah. Right, and they say, let's put the robe back on him. And they would mock him. At this point, Jesus was shaking. He was beginning to go into hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is when you begin to lose a substantial amount of your body fluid. Now they decide, hey, he's a king. Let's give him a crown of thorns. The crown would have looked more like this, which is called a capitata, the Latin word capitata, like a cap. Um, the, the crown that we see, the crown of thorns, is more of a medieval rendition, similar to the crown that kings would wear in Europe. But the Latin form would have been a capitata. Okay. Larry, you do the honors. And make sure that you push it down. because <laughs> <laughs> thorns on it? There are thorns on it. These are taken from the hawthorn tree close by. Right. Okay, we're not going to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we'll just know that this is what it looked like. <laughs> so now, they're going to give him a staff as well, similar to the palms that we used on Palm Sunday. So now he certainly does look, he would have had the crown of thorns. The soldiers would have taken him back to Pilate, and Pilate would have taken him out in front of the crowd. He was so bad that the crowd would not have recognized him. His face would have been puffy. He would have been covered in blood. His eyes may have suddenly turned blood red. And he could hardly stand. He was shaking. And they bring him out. And Pilate says, Ecce homo, Latin. Behold the man. The people would have been shocked you would have heard the crowd, crucify him, crucify him. Now, the, even the Romans didn't typically scourge and crucify. Scourging was bad enough. It was called half death or intermediate death. And the scars would have lasted the entire life of the man. Pilate reaches a point where he goes, okay, I'm not getting through. Um, he asked Jesus, you know, are you the Messiah? Where is your kingdom from? Where is your origin? He used the words, what is your origin? And in this case, it was, it was crucial that he asked that because it's not where were you from, but where is your origin? Eventually, he says, are you a king? And Jesus roundabout way says yes are you saying this on your own or have you heard it from others I am a king now Pilate hears people say he claims himself as a king we're going to get word back to, to Caesar and Pilate you're going to be in trouble because if you allow him to be a king say he's a king then that's in opposition to Caesar Pilate is hearing them talk He's like, uh-oh, this is not good. So what he does is he calls a servant over. John, you're going to be the servant as well. Dave, would you get that picture? And he does this. This is actually from the book of Jeremiah where he washes his hands of this man's blood. And it, it, it was a, a 
a part of the law that said if, if somebody accidentally killed one of your cows you, and it wasn't really your fault, it was an accident, you could do this. You know, it was, it's not my fault, you know. And that's what Pilate was saying. So now they're going to have him sent out and be crucified. Pilate says, fine, take him yourselves, crucify him. So, guys... Here comes, this is called the curry frangio. It is simply the crossbeam. Would have been about six feet high. It would have been five inches or so, three inches. And it would have weighed anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds. It would have had a place hewn in the middle. Now, it would have actually gone all the way through because this piece is what Jesus carried, not the full cross. And there's a reason for that. Number one is the streets were about this size, maybe a little bit wider. So for Jesus to carry the full cross and to have the soldiers around him and to have people uh, looking on, it, it would have been nearly impossible. On the hillside, uh, which we call Golgotha. Golgotha is a Greek word meaning skull. In Latin, it was called calva, which means, Steve, a bald head. <laughs> there you go. A bald head or a skull. Calva, which we get the word calva. So those two words are interchangeable, Golgotha or Calvary. So he was going to carry this about four-tenths of a mile from the fortress Antonia. He would have this on his shoulder. You okay with this? Okay. We'll take this from you. Yeah, good. Here, it's going to go over. Yeah. All right. We're going to have, unfortunately, Tom, it's got to come like this. And there's a reason for it. I'm going to swing around here so that the people can see. <laughs> this is the way he carried it. The longer end was on the back side of him. The front uh, was a shorter piece. His hands would have been tied to this. And the soldiers would have walked in front and behind him and alongside of him. And the tribune or the centurion would have been in front as well. Now, why is this important? Because if the prisoner falls, you don't want this to have uh, so much weight that it comes forward. If the prisoner falls, we want the weight to fall on the prisoner instead of going into the back of the soldiers or the tribune. So here they are marching through the streets. We know that Jesus is exhausted. He has just been beaten up all the while while he's walked. He has been awake literally since 5 the morning before, 5, 5.45 possibly. If he took a nap in the afternoon, that would have given him some break, but he was awake through the night, and he has just lost an immense amount of body fluid. He walks along the Via Dolorosa from Fortress Antonia to this place called Golgotha. Golgotha was just outside the city walls. It was 15 feet high, and it was a rock that was in the form of a skull. That's, that's why they called it the way they did. And on that rock would have been Cruci's steepies, which would have been the trees. The trees would have been in place already. They would have moved him along. You guys can just walk down here. Yes. <laughs> 
and at some point Jesus would have fallen. I'm not going to ask you to fall down. But that's important because physicians who have studied this now have determined that the mortal wounds of Jesus probably occurred when he fell, that he damaged the heart tissue. The physicians have, have looked at this and said that when he fell and carried that weight on him and had that weight fall on top of him and he would have fallen face first, it was like getting hit by a car. And this happened three times. At some point, they would have had asked Simon of Cyrene. And we don't know how, how quickly that happened. Uh, but we don't think Jesus would have lasted too long. You guys can make your way back, if you would. Simon, Chuck, Simon, you, you get to carry the cross now. You are Simon of Cyrene. So you take the cross, the, the curry frogging, and you're not very happy about it, but, you know, you see what's going on. Jesus can hardly stand. He may have actually been supported by the soldiers as he walked because he was losing body fluid as he walked along. Um, so a couple of you, if you would help him. And then, Simon, you're going to make your way to Golgotha. And then you're going to lay the curry frangium down. If you would. That's good. Soldiers, you're going to strip the prisoner. Now at this point, think of what happened. He's been wearing this cloak. And the blood dried. And now it's reopened. The skin is raw. Okay, then they lay him down. As they walked along, uh, if you would lay the uh, cross down a little bit. There you go. And yes, Tom, if you would lay on your back. Jesus. come down a little bit more as they would have walked along uh, the centurion would have carried a pole or one of the soldiers would have carried a pole and there would have been a titulus the sign that Pilate had ordered and uh, the sign was written in three languages it would have looked very much like this uh, enough for people to see but not a huge sign um, the languages would have been Latin on top, Greek, and then Hebrew. And this says, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it would have said the same in three languages. This is going to be placed on top of the cross. Now, they weren't very happy about what the sign said, but uh, that's the way it goes. On our crucifix, you will see four letters. I-N-R-I. -I. In, in Latin, there, there was no J. It was an I that was used. So when you see I-N-R-I, -I, it stands for I, Jesus, N, Nazarenus, R. Rex, I. Eudeor, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So here they are. They're going to stretch out his hands. And they're going to use nails that were about five inches long, would have looked almost exactly like this. 
or like this. And they're going to nail his hands first. I said, the tree is standing upright. The tree was only about six feet high. You know, in, in most of the paintings or pictures that we see, renditions of the crucifixion, it looks like it's way up high and people are staring at it. It was, it was almost eye level. However, men were about five foot five, so it still was a little above them. There were several different kinds of crosses. The crux humilis would have been about six feet high, and the crux sublimis would have been 12 feet high. Sublimis would have been uh, saved for very important people, political prisoners. Jesus was not that. He was an average kind of guy who said he was God. Now, here you go, guys. You get to nail him. Dave, if you can, uh, let's go with this one. So, what they're going to look for, there you two fold it. They're going to look for a part of his hand. It is not in the hand, but in the wrist. You can find it on your own hand if you use the pointer sort of right in the middle, move your hand back and forth, you can feel a little indentation. That is called the stolz space, or the nose furrow. I'm sorry, it's the nars furrow. It is a little space around which there are a lot of bones. They would put the nail there if they could, if the, prison, if the soldiers were good at what they did they would find that space so that it would lock around the bones. There was a doctor from France called Pierre Barbet who was given permission from the French government to take a hundred cadavers. And what he did is he pounded nails into the hands of these cadavers, hung them on a cross to see if it would support the weight. And with all hundred bodies, the hands ripped out. So it was in the wrist. Unfortunately, what would happen is once they did that in the wrist, most likely it would cut or slice into the medial nerve. And what would happen at that point? The hands would form into claws. And that's the way they would hang on the cross. He could not move his hands. The medial nerve was cut. Extremely painful, unbelievably. You've heard the word excruciating? That's what it means. Ex from cruciate, the cross, from the cross, excruciating pain. So find that spot, and Gary, we're going to need you to kneel on Tom's forearm. Why? A pr uh, one of the soldiers would kneel on the forearm, so that the prisoner, as he felt these nails going into his palms, would not break loose and hit one of the soldiers between the legs. So they, they made sure that this was done as quickly as possible. Okay, so go ahead and pound the nail. Let's not do it into his hands. Yeah, three or four good whacks of a hammer that would have looked pretty much exactly like this. And it would have been through his hand. At this point, the prisoner's knees would have come up to his chest. He would have been screaming in pain. The pain would have been incredible. Then they would have jumped to the other side. And there you go. Yes, they would have looked for this stuff space. And there again, the prisoner would have been screaming in pain. Even Jesus would have been screaming in pain. And then they would have lifted him up. It would probably take all of you. So Simon, I'm going to have you. You're, you're now a soldier. You would. Guys, 
help Tom up and... So you can imagine how difficult this was. The soldiers who worked, there you go, good job. This now would have been raised okay, above his head and would have fit over the tree. And they would have wiggled it into place. So if you hold that up, if you could just let Hold that up. Now, there would have been a small bit of the tree that was above. And then the titulus would have been nailed to that small bit of tree. Here, if you could take this off. And so it would have looked like that. Somewhat of a T, but more of a towel more of a, a capital T. And then they would have done the feet. At this point, guys, good enough. Let's, let's call it a night. Uh, all right, yes. Good job. They would have taken a nail. Thanks. Good job. One foot over another. The skeleton that they found in Gabello, Italy, in 2007, was the skeleton of a man who was crucified. And it showed that his feet were placed one on top of another. And one nail went through the feet because the nail was still in the feet when they found him. There was another uh, skeleton that was found in Jerusalem and in 1968. And it was of a man named Johannanen. Uh, and what they found was that his feet were nailed on either side of the tree. And the nails went through his ankles. Yeah. Here's what happens when the feet are nailed like that. They would have put his knees uh, into a squatting position so that they could put the feet down. They would have grabbed the feet, pounded the nail in. Now Jesus is hanging with his knees bent, putting all the weight on his hands and his feet. Except the Romans sometimes used what was called a cedile. It was a peg that, that was placed on the tree and it went between the man's legs so that the man could rest there. And then what would happen is, as you hang from the tree, it doesn't take long before the muscles lock up. And you can breathe in, but you can't breathe out until you do this. <sighs> and he comes down on the cedile that catches between his legs. We don't know if the cedile was used for Jesus, but it was used many times by the Romans. It would offer support for those who were crucified. And again and again, for three hours, Jesus would raise himself up and push on the nail in his feet, and then collapse. We think it was when he pushed himself up that he actually spoke. Because what happens, in order to speak, air has to pass. And the only way is if you push up, I thirst. They offered him pasca, which is a cheap wine, on a hyssop, which is a sponge. The soldier would have taken his sword and, and put it up to his mouth, and Jesus said, no. Jesus saw John and Mary 
he pushed up. Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. <laughs> Jesus' muscles would have been continuously twitching. Again, he lost an incredible amount of blood. His lungs began to fill up with fluid. The pericardium is the sac in which the heart sits. That begins to fill up with fluid. And so what it does is it causes heart failure. And again, physicians think that Jesus' heart was compromised already, and it was just a matter of time. But as the pericardium fills up with fluid, the heart is trying to beat and has more and more pressure. He's dying. He's dying very quickly. Most of it is because of the loss of body fluid. Said he's in hypovolemic shock. He's also dying of asphyxiation. He's drowning in his own body fluids as his lungs and his heart fill up with fluid, the fluid that's left in his body. He pushes up again and again until finally, for the last time, <gasps> Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's finished. <laughs> and he's gone. Scripture tells us that a lot of things happened in the earthquake. and The curtain of the temple was torn. It was said that the true Messiah was the only one who could split the curtain of the temple. It was so thick. It was now after three in the afternoon. At sundown, the Sabbath would begin. Remember, the day started at sundown. And the Sabbath was Saturday. So on Friday evening, it would start the new day. They had to take care of Jesus. The other two men who were at Jesus' side, remember Jesus spoke to them. They were about to die as well. The Romans used something called a patabulum. It was a bar, sometimes a metal bar, sometimes an iron bar, and it was used to blockade doors, to lock doors. And they would come up to the soldiers, I mean to the, to the prisoners, and break their legs. <laughs> Sorry, Father. <laughs> and why would they break their legs? Because they couldn't do this anymore. And it wouldn't take long, and they would die of asphyxiation. They took Jesus down from the cross. Uh, his mother, the disciple, the apostle John, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, two members of the Sanhedrin, and they tried to clean him up as best they could. They were short on time. Joseph of Arimathea had said, what we'll do is we will take Jesus and put him in my tomb, which is 125 feet away. Before that happened, before Jesus uh, was taken down from the cross, I should say that there was a Roman soldier who came not breaking his legs, but making sure that he was dead. They could clearly see he was dead, but they thrust a sword up. And we believe, physicians believe, that it was under the rib cage and that it clipped the pericardium of the heart, that it filled up with pleura, clear liquid, and outflowed what looked like water. And then it clipped the lower chamber of the heart because blood sinks to the lowest part of your body when you die. In this case, the blood would sink 
to the lowest chamber of the heart. But again, they, they cleaned him up as best they could. They carried him uh, to this limestone sepulcher that was about 125 feet from Golgotha, and it was newly hewn. Uh, the countryside was, was covered with sepulchers, but, but this one was close at hand. It, it was about 15 feet deep and had about a four-foot opening. So you'd actually have to crawl through it. And when you did, there was sort of an atrium. And on one side would have been a stone raised part, uh, almost like a table, where you'd put the body and clean it. And they would. They, they would go and they would get spices and perfumes. And they would put these, along with ointments, under the armpits, in the eye sockets, in the ears, uh, in the anus, uh, all the parts of the body that would most likely uh, deteriorate the, the quickest. They would lay the body in a, in a white cloth, and they would have stretched the cloth out under his body, wrapped it around his feet, and brought it up to his neck. Actually, covered his face, but they would have lowered the front part of it so that they could see his face. Because part of the Jewish tradition was they would take a feather, and probably smaller than this, but this is a good visual. They would put it under the nose of the deceased and would let it sit there for about 15 minutes. If the feather didn't move, the soul had left the body, and they were sure that he was dead. They would have moved the body in. They would have wrapped his, tied his hands in front of him. They would have tied his ankles. Why? So that as he was lying there, uh, this couldn't happen. And he could easily roll off the stone. They would have wrapped him in this white cloth, tied him up. However, they would have left it so that they could look at his face. They would have been able to bring the cloth down to look on his face. There would have been tapers, little candles on the wall in the darkness. And once they had him laid out, they would have said their goodbyes and then extinguished the tapers backed out of the tomb and rolled the stone called a gallo. It would have been a huge rock that would have been in front of the tomb. And there they would have left him. I have some theories about Jesus' death. What happens, what would happen at that moment that he died wasn't just a point in time, but it was a point out of time. In other words, it's still happening. We all have free will. And so we have decisions to make on how we live our lives. Those decisions affected pain that Jesus went through. What would happen? Here's a thought for, for your Holy Week. What would happen if that moment is actually now still occurring? And every decision you make affects the pain of Jesus on the cross. Wouldn't we live our lives differently if we knew that we could Increase his pain or decrease his pain? Interesting thought. Here's the last thought of the evening. Jesus died for each of us. We're told this from the time that we're children. Is it possible that he has a relationship with each of us? Absolutely. 
And if so, if he died for our sins, then when he did this for the last time, <gasps> it's finished. Then your face was on his mind. I wish you a happy Easter. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and with your spirit. Amen. And with your spirit.